Welcome. I'm David Thorburn, the director of the MIT Communications Forum. Uh, normally, we put the website's uh, uh, homepage on the on the screen, but I won't. Uh, uh, we haven't done that today. So let me just mention that this is the second of four forums we're sponsoring this spring. Uh, the third will be offered on Thursday, April 5th, and its title is "Adapting Journalism to the Web," and it's going to be a wide-ranging discussion about the ways in which the journalistic principles and techniques of the print era are migrating or not migrating onto the web, and whether that's a good or a bad thing. Uh, the final uh, event will be held at the end of th uh, the term in early May, on May 4th, and it's titled Electronic Literature and Future Books. And I hope many of you will attend that uh, uh, event or pay attention to the uh, 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 or check the we check our website where our events are archived in various formats. Um, it's uh, it, it remains only for me to welcome our speakers and to indicate to those of you in the audience who are uh, new today that uh, in some sense this forum represents a kind of culmination of a day long set of conversations amongst uh, documentary filmmakers, producers, media practitioners of various kinds, and scholars. And my hope is that the people at the table will recall remember that some members of the audience haven't been there for your earlier discourse, distill your ideas. Uh, we're very eager to hear your most uh, uh, powerful and uh, uh, compelling insights about this central subject. Uh, our moderator today is my friend and colleague, William Uricchio, the director of, of the Comparative Media Studies program and the author of, uh, or editor of a number of significant books, uh, in, in, including mo uh, most recently two uh, books that I think are edited books, Media Cultures and We Europeans, Media, New Collectivities, and Europe. I perhaps should conclude here by saying that uh, in the, uh, uh, as the comparative media studies program has evolved, especially trying to recover from the departure of the visionary Henry Jenkins, William Uricchio has been our lodestar and leader. And he's been doing, I think, quite remarkable work in renovating and reconstituting the comparative media studies program. One piece of evidence for that is this remarkable forum and the activities that preceded it in which so many media practitioners began to talk about new forms of documentary. William. David, thanks, thanks for the kind words. Um, and thank you for coming tonight. So as David uh, said, we had a very exciting day uh, behind our back. This is in a certain way the culmination of the day. Uh, and it brought together as David said, makers and uh, academics, but it also brought together funders and folks from festivals. Uh, and the mix was an unusual mix. You don't often see more than two sets of these players in one room at one time. What's going on right now in documentary is nothing short of transformational amazing. Um, one of the things I spoke about this morning in my opening comments, I tried to make the case that what's happening today with interactive, on, usually online documentary, um, sometimes location-based documentary, sometimes transmedia documentary, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of form out there. What's happening today is, it, to my mind, very similar to what happened almost 100 plus years ago with the birth of the film industry. Documentary, which some of us think of as the kind of lame cousin of the feature film, has in fact been a driver of technology. It's been out in front from the get-go. Something like 80% of the films made uh, between the start of film in 1895 and somewhere around 1904, 1905, close to 80% of what was copyrighted anyway was nonfiction. Now, in our world today, that seems a little odd because we would probably think that most of what's out there is fictional. If you look at some of the first sound films, um, The Jazz Singer is the one, we uh, we, the one we celebrate here in the US, but in Germany, the first, film, the first sound film was Melody der Welt, a documentary. In Russia, it was Vertov's Enthusiasm. So documentary, again, was pushing the envelope in terms of trying out new technologies. A lot of new color technology was deployed with, uh, with documentary. A lot of the advances in 16 millimeter uh, and you know, portable sound, the, the advent of cinema verite and direct cinema. That transformation in production is something that occurred in documentary. And not just that it, you know, it's not just about new tools. There was a reimagination of the subject, 
of the relationship between the maker and the subject that, that those new tools uh, made possible. And I guess where we are today is at a real turning point in film. Things like interactive film that, that the Media Lab, the place we're in right now, pioneered in back in the 80s. Those techniques, which were very labor intensive, very technology intensive, have become quite simple with our new technologies. And documentary, as ever, is the first to pick that up and drive it ahead. So the folks here at this table today all represent people who are working in different aspects of these new developments, and I'll introduce them in a second. But the thing I really want to emphasize, and it was the, the point of today's discussion, these new developments are coming from unexpected places. It's not as though the documentary community has, has thrown up its hands and abandoned long-form linear documentary. That's alive and well and, and will remain so. Rather, it's that the, the radical or progressive fringe of the documentary community has picked up on some of these two techniques. They've seen that they can do some remarkable things with it. It's not just the radical fringe, it's organizations like the National Film Board of Canada uh, that have, done, have made a major commitment in this sector, a growing commitment, and they've seen the results in terms of growing audience share, in terms of being able to reach beyond the broadcast market, the national limits of a broadcast market, and reach an international market. They've seen the ability of these new forms to engage audiences, not just to let audiences watch these films and maybe be inspired by them, but actually deepen themselves, move around, navigate, explore, and engage in this work. A lot of other disciplines besides just uh, documentary makers have been involved here, and I just want to mention a few. People that are involved in interactive art or new media art have been central to these developments. Folks coming from areas like cartography, and especially performative cartography, where the motion of the body in space, it's not just about maps, it's about performing maps. Those folks have been very important. Game studies has been an area that's yielded a lot. Gamers often think about narrative worlds, worlds of possibility that the user has to negotiate and navigate. Um, so a lot of development here, and what we're here to, you know, naturally these developments bring with them terrific opportunities, but also a lot of challenges. Challenges like language. Do we call this documentary, or do we call it interactive, or collaborative, or location? Do we use some, some prefix? Um, I guess you could answer that question by thinking about video. Do we now, do we call it all the time digital video? We've dropped the digital. We just call it video. So, Probably we're in a transition phase and we'll keep those, those prefixes, but they're not long to stay. Um, I think another set of questions that we have are about frameworks for evaluation. How do you tell a good one from a bad one? Um, that's very important to funders. It's very important to publics because if they hit a few bad ones, they're probably not going to go back for more. So how can we build up a body of criticism, a set of critical frameworks to understand these new film forms? Um, a lot of questions here and, you know, questions that have implications for funders. What will they fund and what won't they fund? What category do things fit in? How do we show these things at festivals? Something that's best seen on a laptop where you, the user, can navigate your way through it. What do you do in a public setting? So these are some of the questions that are percolating through this space. The main thing I want to get across is that this is an incredibly exciting moment. This is a moment where we're seeing the birth of a set of new strategies, new possibilities, new forms. They have not yet been tamed. There's not yet an orthodoxy or a set of rules or a set of conventions for people to fall back on. There's nothing but possibility. And that's exciting. That's a really exciting moment. Uh, it's exciting for makers because they can do anything and, it, and, and see if it works, throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. It's exciting for, for, for us, uh, the participants, we're no longer the audience, but now we're co-collaborators in these projects. Um, and it, it's going to be interesting to see what survives, which of these forms, you know, if there's the usual process of reification and hard wiring, hard baking of some forms, or if we're actually going to see uh, this, this, this plurality increase. Um, a lot of big questions in terms of areas like ethics. Who owns this material that's online? If you do a cut version, are you the owner, or is the person who supplied the footage the owner? Crowdsourcing, what are the ethics of, you know, is there an ethical issue there if you're making money on the backs of what the, the crowd has produced? A ton of issues on that sector. A whole lot of issues having to do with legacy. How will we preserve and hold this moment? How do we keep these artifacts? Many of them are on relatively fragile platforms, platforms that are here today and gone next year. Sometimes they morph over, sometimes they don't. But for historians, you know, or, or at least my 
the, the historians of the future, folks with my line of work, when they come back and look at this moment, what will be here to look at? Will they see the various, the, 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 the huge array of steps that we've taken? So these and a bunch of other questions are things that we'll bring up um, with the panel. And the format today will essentially be to, um, to have a discussion uh, with the panelists. Um, I'd like to introduce them. I'll introduce them as a group and then go through one by one with a few questions uh, so we can talk about who they are, what their work is, and then we'll open it up uh, for discussion. So next to me here is Ingrid uh, Kopp, who's uh, the new media consultant for the Tribeca Film Institute, where she runs the TFI New Media Fund. And that's really crucial because that's the place that stimulates, that, that makes possible a lot of this new work. It's a very new fund. It's uh, started up this year, 2011. And basically, it's brokering forward fund money. Uh, Ingrid is the kind of has the critical acumen and nose and apparatus to to sort of shepherd this money into the hands of the right people. Uh, so it's a very she occupies a very crucial bottleneck of possibility. She stands between the resources and those out there with a lot of good ideas, and so a key decision maker, a shaper of the of the field. Next to Ingrid is Patricia Zimmerman, uh, a, a fellow academic. Uh, Patty and I have been around the block a few times and know each other for many years. She's professor in the Department of Cinema, Photography, and Media Arts at Ithaca College, co-directs the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival, author of Real Families, A Social History of Amateur Film, uh, Mining the Home Movie, Excavation the History and Memories, States of Emergency, Documentaries, Wars, and Democracy. And Patty's, what's really intriguing about Patty's work is that it's really focused on sectors that a lot of other scholars have ignored. So the home movie is a great example of a, of a kind of Again, a, a grassroots approach to media, something that ordinary people do, doesn't necessarily get a lot of public attention, but it has profound private meaning. And um, that's a crucial sector, especially today as we think about collaborative and community-based filmmaking. So that's where some of her work is situated. Um, next to Patty is Jerry Flahive who is a senior producer for the National Film Board of Canada, a remarkable organization, a, one of the world's few that continues to fund the production of documentaries on a relatively large scale. I think, Jerry, you said 14,000 documentaries to date. That's, that's an incredible record. And um, he's, he's been the producer on a, a number of award-winning films, Water Life and, and High Rise, uh, prominent among them, and, and we'll talk about those. Um, he's in the position, he's someone who's really seen the transformation of this, of, of, of the industry. He's been there for the long haul, has seen this transformation happen, and he's seen it happen in an organization that has been, I think, really the world's leader. If one had to point to an organization that is doing some of the most interesting work out there, it's, it's the work that's coming out of NFB for a bunch of distinctive Canadian reasons that we will soon discover. And finally, at the end of the table is, is Sher, uh, Shari Frilo who's senior programmer for the Sundance Film Festival and curator of the New Frontier section there. And the New Frontier section is where this kind of work, installation-based documentary, uh, interactive documentary, the new stuff, it's the repository of the new. And, Sh and Shari is, in that sense, uh, just as Ingrid is sort of funneling the money, Shari is shaping the taste out there and also helping with the financial, obviously through that, the financial side. Exhibition is a really crucial sector, and that's something that, as a festival, as someone who, who organizes a festival, uh, it's really a, a, a set of concerns that she's faced with on a, on a regular basis. Shar, you've been there for 11 years, I think, so you've been there. Yeah, we'll stop at 11. <laughs> <laughs> okay, won't count. Um, and I should probably mention that you're also an award-winning filmmaker and, and artist. You've done installation work as well as film work and uh, been... Your work's been seen in lots of festivals, so you've been on both sides of, 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 of that dance. Um, and Shari, why don't I just, um, well, no, maybe Ingrid, I'll start with you, because money is where a lot of this begins, so. Um, Probably should go to Canada, then. <laughs> <laughs> We're only little. Well, you know, that's, no, let, let's do that. That's not a bad idea, because that's a, there's an institutional model that covers everything. You guys worry about exhibition, distribution, funding. Um, there have been some interesting changes there, and that's probably, the rock against which, or the metric against which all of the things are measured. And then we can see how the, the rest of us are trying to scramble and catch up and make do. Um, so maybe just to start there, it would be great, I guess let's just start with what do you do? What's a, what's sure. a day in your life? What does a producer at NFB do? 
Well, um, I, I do what every other producer does, except I'm a civil servant. Um, it, it is a uniquely Canadian institution, I think, where we're, we're not a funder, we're not a, a broadcaster, we're not an arts council, we're actually producers and, and distributors and have been doing that since 1939. So it's, it's within the Canadian context, it's, our mandate actually hasn't changed in almost 75 years. It's to interpret Canada to Canadians and people in other nations. So I was saying to somebody about the 14,000 films and somebody was questioning, are there, are there really 14,000 stories in Canada to be told? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we done them all by now? So, um, no, there's, we do another 100 every year. There's apparently a few people we missed. I, I think it's, it's, it's part of your citizenship in Canada. You get to be in an NFB film. And <laughs> you just show your passport, you're, you're in. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's an institution that's uh, survived and thrived, uh, and, and part of that role is... Um, is pushing the boundaries. It's actually, even though we're a government department, we, d we report financially and, you know, legally to the government, but we don't make government films. And there were other bodies like that decades ago in Australia and India and places like that, other places that seen the influence of John Gerson, but there's really nothing else left uh, like it. So we have this unique independence, uh, editorial independence, and... Uh, I think we, we do tell stories probably in a less provincial way than we did 50, 60 years ago because there's a thriving film and media industry in Canada, so we don't need to make the films about uh, beaver dams and wheat uh, that maybe we did in the, although there's nothing wrong with that, um, that we did, you know, 50 years ago. So it's a, it's a much broader brief, and there, it may sound strange coming from uh, a civil servant as I am, but uh, we're very director-driven. The focus is very much on point-of-view documentaries, um, that, that come from, are driven by a creative person. Um, and the move into interactive, um, which really only started a few years ago, it comes from a creative place. It really comes from an embracing the creative possibilities, uh, as the film board always has done. Um, not out of any imperative to, you know, for distribution. There, there are benefits from, uh, certainly from distribution and, and uh, production cost sides. I wouldn't deny that as a producer, that... I can produce something like uh, one of the high-rise projects we did uh, out my window, which is 13 apartments in 13 cities all over the world. Uh, cost about $150,000. If we'd done that as a film, it probably would have been $750,000. Wow. But that's not why we did it that way. And, and I think I'm most excited by the creative possibilities for interactivity. I think I, I absolutely agree. It's, it's an incredibly exciting time. And I fear a little bit that... There is a, a barrier for documentary filmmakers who are fearing to make the leap. Um, and so the, the field is going to be filled up with people who, you know, and this could be seen as a kind of a threat in a way, um, who are not filmmakers um, and probably aren't even necessarily thinking of themselves as making documentaries. If you're doing a data visualization project or a documentary app, is that a, is that a documentary? Mm -hmm. So... Um, I think our legacy of, of having done as much work as we have over that many years probably gives us a certain cultural license to do the things that we do. There's well, a deep respect amongst the Canadian public for it. So I, I totally understand it's not a model that, you know, just why don't other countries do this? Uh, Canada was, you know, is a big place with a very small number of people in 1939 when it started. So there were historical roots. Norway, Norway may be thinking about it. Right, um, right. But, you know, you, you, you make an interesting point. I just want to follow. So John Grierson starts this operation off, and, and he's very much someone with the sense of both the authorial vision, the director's vision, and at the same time, a notion of a, of a kind of commitment. Mm -hmm. But this new turn towards interactivity in certain ways can be seen, at least the fear of some right. traditional filmmakers is that this is exactly taking away some of their control. Yeah. You're giving the audience a choice mm -hmm. in some cases mm -hmm. to look at this or to look at that, to yeah. navigate this way or that way. So how does that align with, because you said there's this very strong commitment to the director. Yeah. Is I, this, I, does I, this rub against that? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think, I think giving the audience that choice, again, as you said, um, I mean, we're spending a very large percentage of our production dollars on interactive. It's about 25%. So I, there probably aren't very many institutions in the world spending. But that means we're spending 75% still on linear films. So, you know, we're not fearing that that pure director vision of a linear experience that the audience sits down and watches is, is going to go away, as, as you said. But I, I don't think giving the audience, uh, the users, some greater role to engage in how they want it, the story to unfold takes that away. I still absolutely believe that, and I work with an extraordinary uh, filmmaker, Katarina Sizik, behind uh, the High Rise Project. There, 
you know, as much as there's talk about crowdsourcing and uh, you know, opening up uh, portals for content and user gen and all of that stuff, I don't think it works unless there's a creative vision mm -hmm. behind that. It maybe isn't one person, but it, it's, it's perhaps several people, and I think there has to be a strong creative concept there. And so there's still, uh, there are degrees of collaboration, you know, and, and in our project High Rise, which is four years, um, there are some projects that are more collaborative than others. And, and so CAD is still, there's still a authorial voice there. There's still a sensibility that, that drives that. And so I don't think it's, it's just, it's trying something out uh, that's it's a little bit different. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think it's anything to fear. So one of the one of the interesting things that's happening is that uh, these forms, as I've already suggested, uh, often are are seen on computers and people navigate their way through it, and that doesn't align very well with the needs of sort of cinemas, you know, the old style cinema where you have a mass audience, a collective, and there's I guess a trade off. So you're trading off the experience of being with a mass audience for the uh, the freedom to kind of go where you want to go and navigate. I imagine there's also some interesting data trails left behind. Are you are you able to better understand your audiences and what their mm -hmm. experiences are like, where those audiences even are on the yep. planet, and how does that align with the National Film Board's remit? I imagine it's it's the National Film Board of Canada for a reason. Yeah. So what happens with things that happen outside the border? Is that an well, issue? Well, it's uh, it's shocking to discover that people outside of Canada are interested in Canadian stories. I've, I've uh, reached this point in my life. That Canadians generally feel no one else would be interested in anything Canadian. Um, but uh, the shocking news is that the interactive work it reaches audiences all over the world um, on a very, very Canadian subjects. And I think that that's opened our eyes to um, if work is good and it has a universal quality to it. I mean, this may seem obvious uh, to perhaps American producers whose work is seen all over the world. But uh, with documentary films, you often don't know. You, you know, our films are sometimes sold uh, around the world to broadcasters who go to festivals. and we kind of don't really know who's seeing them in any quantitative way. With interactive work, there's a stream of data. You see how long people stay. You see, uh, w w you know, we had a project, one of our high-rise projects, within two weeks, of people from 180 countries had come to it. Wow. And that's, we have no marketing, we have no massive marketing campaigns to do this. Um, so I think people are interested, again, the shocking news is they're interested in good work. And, and I think audiences are actually ahead of us often, you know, I, uh, your point about these prefaces of, you know, it's an interactive documentary, I think it probably will seem as quaint as saying something is a VHS documentary, you know, in a few years. They're just there, their people are open to things in the, in, the, in the web environment that they might not be open to in a, in a public environment or coming into a theater. And so I think it's a very fluid exchange and we're, you know, the, the maybe troubling thing that is a creative challenge that we learn is people don't stay very long. You know, I mean, I think all of us know our own habits on the web, but you know, when we started some of our interactive work as a producer of films that are sometimes feature length, to be told, oh, you know, seven minutes, that's, that's as long as people will stick around, um, is, is, a, is troubling. But, uh, and it may influence whether work, interactive work is made in a more modular way so people can almost take pieces of it, but what we did find is there's a, uh, often a very high return rate, so people are coming back. Mm -hmm. You can track that. The same user has come back uh, a number of times, and so um, I think the, the creative implications of that, of responding to that kind of experience data, is it's just too early. Like, this is, we're talking a couple of years here mm -hmm. since we've, we've been doing this, and anybody's been doing it, in a way. So one last question, and I hope it's not impolitic to ask this of a civil servant. But there are a lot of ways to try to understand this. You, you folks have embraced interact, interactive documentary, or documentary, mm -hmm. this new documentary, with a vigor that is unmatched. Uh, maybe the French have actually done. The French yeah, and Australians Arte are France actually doing, are doing some really good work strong. as well. Um, and Arte for a different set of reasons. And I guess I'm wondering, is this a matter of um, just having the wit to take quick advantage of technological affordance? Is this a budgetary issue? Could this be a political issue? I know your government is, uh, you know, in, in, in step with the rest of the Western world, right. has moved a bit to the right. Um, culture is often the first thing targeted. Is innovation part of an argument to, to keep the, the National Film Board strong? Or do you see any of those as... as um, um, I, I mean, blessedly, we're, we're quite removed from politics in that sense, and, and I, think, I think what we've done is, is been applauded by the government 
but um, you know, I mean, I guess there was just as much of a risk that we would fail, that these would be seen as these sort of laboratory experiments, uh, these weird interactive documentaries that didn't quite work. Um, and, and so I, you know, there wasn't necessarily a guaranteed payoff in, in if, if, that was, if that had been the reason, which it wasn't. Um, financially, I mean, there, you know, it's a government agency and, and you know, cuts, cuts will come probably in the future. But um, yeah, that's not, really, that's not really driving it. I think it is, it's, it came from the top. It came from Tom Perlmutter, who's the head of the film boards in, in around 2006, saying um, we should really embrace the web as a platform to make things. And a project I did with Kat Sizik just before High Rise called Filmmaker in Residence, um, which was one of the first long form interactive documentaries we did in 2006. We started work on that project in 2004. There was no Facebook, no YouTube, no Twitter. So even saying we're making films to show on the web would have been a somewhat radical uh, notion. But e the idea of a web site as, as, a, as the creative production uh, was kind of inexplicable, you know, in 2005. That, that was, it's like websites are there to market films. That's, that's their sole purpose, isn't that right? Um, so it's very, very recent, and I think it wasn't, it, it, you know, we weren't putting 25% of our production dollars in day one. You know, there were some small experiments and, mm -hmm. and some small things, and even something like Water Life, which has had one and a half million unique visitors from all over the world, cost $55,000. So it's not, uh, it's not a million dollar uh, gamble, and I just just to recall one of the things you said earlier today because it's a striking it's a it's it's a real endorsement I think of the way the the National Film Board works. You said you had you were funded you you put in a proposal to fund a project to do four years of research and you weren't sure what kind of artifacts were going to come out. That's Dr. right. That's the that's high rise. That's the project we're doing that's right astounding. now. That's astounding. Um, which is a high rise is a four year mini media project looking at how we live vertically around the world and they're. We have strong roots and strong storytelling in Toronto, but we've done uh, part of the project uh, has been in other cities around the world. And so it came out of that filmmaker residence project we did in a hospital where we kind of explored collaboration, working with people rather than making a single film about a subject is to spend a lot of time around a subject, around original research and with communities and see what emerges. And so by the time we got to the table with the high rise idea in around 2008, I think we were trusted sufficiently uh, in that context, and I'm, you know, privileged to work in a place that gives us that trust where we said, we've done deep research, this is a, this is a, a good creative concept, uh, more than half the people in the world are living in cities, billions of us live in apartment buildings, there's something there, uh, but we want it to be platform agnostic, we don't know what we're going to make, and they said yes. So we've made a bunch of things so far. And we've done installations and live performances and uh, some short films and mostly, uh, mostly it's all up at highrise.nfb.ca. Most of it is web-based work. But we've been approached by a publisher to do a book and we've been approached by uh, radio producers to do radio and somebody from a theater company wants to adapt some of the work for theater. So it's a laboratory wow. within a laboratory and uh, I think we still have the responsibility to do good work that reaches audiences. That doesn't go away. Wow. Great. So, Ingrid, I'm going to turn to you because we're talking about it. So this is the way the state does it, and, and in the enlightened state, the yeah. um, socialist. <laughs> socialist, socialist paradise. So um, <laughs> here in the land of the greenback, um, things work a little bit differently. Right. So you run a new media fund yeah. for a film festival. No, I, oh, so, yeah, it's, it, but it is confusing. So um, the Tribeca Film Institute, which is where I am uh, working on this fund, is the non-profit bit of Tribeca, which is this, like, overarching thing, which includes the Tribeca Film Festival, okay. which is, so we're, we're part of the same family, but we're, we're slightly separate. We're in separate offices. Um, and so the Tribeca Film Institute is the, is the non-profit institute w where we support filmmakers with a variety of grants across both narrative and documentaries. And, um, and last year we launched this TFI New Media Fund to start exploring um, interactive documentary funding. Uh, so, I mean, I, you know, I've been full of uh, both admiration and, and green envy for uh, all the work that the NFB have been doing in this space for, for as long as they've been doing this interactive stuff. And, um, you know, and, and obviously we have a very, very different model because ours is a straight fund. Um, we fund four to eight projects a year um, in the range, bet uh, they, the funds range between 50 and 100,000, and it's a straight fund, so we, we don't hold any rights. 
and uh, we don't do any production on our end. Um, although, I mean, we can talk about this later, we have ended up becoming more involved with the projects in this fund than in other funds for lots of reasons, beca because they need the support. So we're trying to build that in. Now, in traditional funding, either for a feature or for a documentary, there are a lot of sort of standard things you can look at. Mm -hmm. You can look at the, the CV of the filmmaker. You can see what they made before. You know what a treatment looks like. You know what a film is supposed to sort of look like. Mm -hmm. How does that work with these, with these objects? Right. Well, I think, you know, what, one of the things that I think uh, it was really interesting when we were setting up this fund is, although I do agree that a lot of innovation comes from within documentary, I do think that in, in this sphere, um, the last place I was looking for innovation was generally the documentary community. Um, I mean, outside of the NFB and Arte, there really is hardly, there was and is hardly any work being done in this space. And, and like Jerry, I, you know, I've been really concerned with look, looking at what happened with newspapers online and how, you know, when the, the Times and other sort of big print um, papers, they were, you know, very nervous about getting online. And so you had like Yahoo News and the Huffington Post rushing in to fill that space. And for me, I was always really concerned that that was going to happen with with the documentary space because a lot of the most creative and clever and you know truly interactive experiments I was seeing online were coming from the brand space um, because obviously advertisers are desperate to sell things to audiences who are fleeing from the 30 second spot on television and so you know there was so much innovation there and so actually you know a lot of the inspiration I was getting was actually outside of documentary and I was thinking what if we could bring the stories that we really care about that are not selling things, that are actually about creating the culture that is important to us, to this space. Um, and what if we bring like all these amazing documentary filmmakers and this incredible technology together um, so that we can innovate in the space as well and it's not just left to selling things. That was really, for me, a, a really key part of, of setting this fund up. Mm -hmm. And let me just, so that's, that suggests that your role is something of a curator that you're someone who has a sense of where you'd like the field to go, what you think is what's interesting and what is less interesting. And mm -hmm. you can, in a certain sense, use, use, the, use the fund as a way to stimulate um, a vision, as, yeah. as a way to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, it, you're right. And I'm, I'm also very nervous of that, actually, um, because, you know, I think, I mean, I think one of the things that I've brought to this, which um, is great, is that I'm really interested in technology generally, and I'm, you know, I, I think it's it's very interesting to for me to sort of have a sort of overarching sense of where things are going and how people are using technology and you know what's happening in, in branding and interactive journalism across the field. To me, that's very very interesting, and the sort of digital ecosystem is all very relevant to this field. Um, but I also, you know, it's definitely through my lens. So one of the things that worries me a little bit, and I don't know if this is something that comes up at the NFB, but I, I would hate for this fund and my vision to be this gatekeeper that sort of decides, because I've tried to be really non-prescriptive in, in what this interactive stuff looks like, um, because I really do want it to be open. I want there to be space for open source projects and iPad apps and, you know, um, total transmedia experiences, whatever is necessary for that project. Um, but I'm also, you know, I, I'm definitely bringing my background to this work, and um, and I I, do, I am concerned that if there isn't more, more that if there aren't more voices mm -hmm. to sort of balance me and to balance this fund, that it, it may become like sort of my vision of what this should be, which I th is necessarily going to be narrow. Well, I'm grateful actually you're at the helm in this case because you have a very broad vision, as far as I can tell, and as you just said, and it sounds like the the the. The controlling part of your vision is really probably more about quality. It's not about what the form is per se, as much as is it going to be a good example of whatever it tries to be. How do you judge that? Because it strikes me. Look, I mean, I read a lot about this on the web, and I'm not. This, I'm not really bowled over by the level of criticism uh, of, of, a, of a critical culture. I don't mean yeah. in a negative sense, mm -hmm. but just in an analytic or a evaluative sense. I don't see a lot of. I mean, there's there's a lot that's out there, but. I, there aren't reliable voices or many reliable right. voices that I turn to, which one knows, I mean, you know who to turn to in, or at least you know how to assess opinions in the world of linear documentary mm -hmm. or feature film. So how do you, how do you make those calls? Where do you, how do you get informed, how do you inform yourself? Well, it's, it's, I think it's two things. I mean, there's, there's the sort of lack of critical voices and then there's also, you know, having to write guidelines for a fund, which is very specific, like, you know, about this fund, this is what we're looking for, points one, two, three, four. Um, and in order to do that, I mean, I, I had to just make decisions. And what I tried to do is just keep it really open. So I, bas I basically said, um, tell us what you're doing, tell us why you're doing it, and we, we'll, we'll know it when we see it. I mean, that really is, I mean, I, I think this will change, but right now that, that is the guidelines. Um, in terms of critical discourse, I agree, and I, you know, it would be great if there was more 
discussion around this work. The one thing that I am a bit nervous about, though, and I, I mentioned this before um, when I was talking during the day today, um, is that we need to be able to fail in the space. I think it's so important that there's a space for experimentation and failure, um, good failure. And, um, and one of the things that I do get a bit worried about is, and, and maybe it's because I'm so interested in the technology as well, so I'm always looking at like how things are built and the technology they used, and is it open source, and you know what happened with the audience. And, but, but one of the things that does worry me is some of these projects may seem a little bit gimmicky sometimes, and maybe they don't have the, um, the sort of slam dunk uh, effect of a you know of a great linear documentary that goes to all the big festivals and wins awards and you know it's like you know you know all the things that it needs to hit in order to be a respected documentary and we don't really have that in the space so I'm I also feel a bit protective of these sort of little mm. experiments growing up and that you know we don't want to like slam them down before they've had a chance to really find their space and one of the things that I think is really important with the fund is that we're we are allowed to be part of that experimentation process rather than kind of come out the gate saying, okay, we've solved this. Because um, I knew that was never going to be the case. Yeah. Oh, terrific. So you're in year one, still mm -hmm. in year one. Yeah. No, year two is. Well, we've, we've, we've just closed submissions for year two. Okay. So yeah, so we're sophomores now. So, so sophomore you're at the start of this. And, and, and besides more money to work with, mm -hmm. what's your fantasy about where this could go? If you were to think over the next decade, where could this, where could this fund go, and maybe where could the field go as, yeah. you, as you look at it? I mean, I definitely look at it with, with, within the field um, because I think, you know, one fund, I, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you know this, but, you know, generally documentary funds tend to be 10,000 here, 40,000 here, maybe 50 or 100,000 if you're really lucky. And, you know, I'm under no, I, I know that, that it's a little piece of what you need to get your project made. And in the US, what we tend to do is, you know, we sort of become sort of story entrepreneurs and we piece together the funding as we go until we manage to make something. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I think it definitely has to be, I look at it as part of the field as a whole. One fund is not gonna be enough. Um, but one of the things that I am really, really, really keen on building is more research and development. And so um, this is something else that I brought up earlier. I, I want more rapid prototyping. I want more experimentation where we can sort of fail fast and better and learn from our failures or good failures. I don't know if there's a word for good failures. Um, so that there's really like, a, you know, like there is in the sort of startup entrepreneurial community, the sense of like you can try things, see what works, see what doesn't work and move on. Um, so that there's just more work being produced and more experimentation happening. And one of the things specifically with the fund that I really want to do is because we're not producers, so we don't really have a sort of day-to-day -day hand in the projects, but one of the things we are doing is getting the, the fundees, the grantees, to collaborate with each other so that they're sharing, and, and I, I facilitate that. And then we, we were also doing a lab at the festival, and what I'd like to do is really sort of build more sort of lab support and mentorship on, in every stage of the process so that these projects have, get the help that they need in terms of connecting with coders and developers and designers, which is really key. Thinking about user experience, thinking about all the things you need to think about now to make work in the space. Mm. Um, so being able to build that into the fund, I think, would be really amazing. That's terrific. That's terrific. And it makes me think of uh, two comments that came up in, in today's session that I just want to mention. One was with regard to a, a project like High Rise. Um, where you know we, we mentioned the luxury of four, four years of research and let's see what happens. Um, a lot of that research was carried out with universities. And that strikes me as a very fertile ground. I mean, there are a lot of universities, there's a lot of great research that finds its way into poorly read publications and uh, they could have much greater impact mm -hmm. in the hands of people that do some you know creative interpretation of uh, actuality. Um, the can, can I, I think it challenges us as documentary filmmakers to try to be running alongside academic research, a academics who are doing leading edge research rather than us, you know, kind of waiting till it's finished, right, you right, know, right. Is, is that's an interesting but scary space sometimes yeah. to be in. Um, you know, we've done documentaries where there's, there isn't a body of work to support. I've actually had films rejected uh, at proposal stage because there wasn't a body of academic work to sort of support it. And we had to kind of push back. So that's a really interesting place to be uh, you know, I think that is a totally untapped resource mm -hmm. is that relationship, whether it's linear docs or interactive mm -hmm. between doc filmmakers and uh, academics. Well, so I, I was just going to say, so that, that so one of the things we've just set up in terms, uh, you know, in terms of building this this collaborative community um, of practitioners and thinkers, is we've we've set up this uh, project called Living Docs with the Center for Social Media at the American University, with Mozilla who do Firefox, with uh, ITVS and with BayVac in the, in the Bay Area. 
uh, where we can sort of share information and code um, and resources around um, open source documentary practice. And I'd love to see more of that, you know, more kind of um, more kind of sharing of resources across disciplines. Because one, I, was, I, I call, I've started to call convergence smush, because I keep thinking about it like we're, we're all smushing, you know, um, media's are smushing, but also industries are smushing, and silos are breaking down. So for me, it's it's like where do we innovate in the smush? And that's how I always, <laughs> that is my incredibly academic way of thinking about the space. <laughs> Great, and it's a space where we thrive in smush here, so uh, we need to we need to talk. Um, the other thing I just want to mention because I'm, I'm thinking of it now, but it, it also came up today, which was the the ways. And 18 days in Egypt is a great example of this, where you can actually learn from good experiences or bad as people interact with these documentaries mm -hmm. online. You can actually respond and tweak your tweak your your material to work better with the audience, to sort of see what's not working, what could be enhanced. And that, that interactivity between the maker and the, and the user is actually another great affordance mm -hmm. and uh, so terrific. So Shari, let's turn over to the, to the world of um, exhibition. Um, so to, in order to sort of put festivals into perspective and the challenges of showing interactive documentaries and how, how users are going to engage with them, what can you tell us about your years at the uh, at, at Sundance and um, what can you tell us what have you learned what have you in terms of how to exhibit this material in terms of how users work with it well I've been uh, my original and remaining continuing role is to select films for the festival and I, I select feature documentaries feature films um, and well I guess the I suppose what I've learned is <coughs> At Sundance, we're a discovery festival. We, we follow the artist. And uh, New Frontier has been set up uh, to allow us to continue to do that. So it's, a, it's very much within the continuum of our mission and our interest as a discovery festival. Uh, in, in terms of exhibiting and making that work accessible to audiences is, uh, is a little bit of a different thing uh, in terms of you know, just sort of when people are ready for what. It is, it's often the case, and books have been read, written about this, that the artists are, are, are ahead of even the mathematicians and the scientists in terms of their paradigms and how they think about things. And they certainly are ahead of the audiences. Uh, but I think nowadays the audiences are actually starting to catch up, and industries are starting to catch up out of necessity, I think, particularly in the film industry. <clears throat> the, um, it's, you know, with, with New Frontier, Frontier was a section of the festival that's, that's always been uh, had an eye trained on innovation, experimentation, expanding the envelope of how to tell stories. And so it was a natural place uh, to develop um, a showcase for, for new, new forms of, of storytelling. Uh, so we, we re-inaugurated the frontier as new frontier and uh, sort of thought very carefully about how to build uh, a space and really, really what what we what we realize is, is that we had to build a culture within the festival culture for this work. It's not so much you know what corner, what building we're going to show this work, but actually how do we how do we how do we um, nurture a culture for this work, or nurture a culture for curiosity, uh, for a, a different kind, a new kind of storytelling. So the way that we built this platform uh, was to think about uh, you know work that, that we're, we're seeing in the art world and in new media that speaks a film festival language, that see, speaks a cinematic language that's accessible, so that when people come in and see the work, they don't feel like they've read the wrong books and walk out, you know, in, in the midst of a very, very busy festival environment that's really important. Uh, uh, the other part of it is, um, you know, the, the space has to be comfortable, uh, the space has to be social, it has to resonate with not only the festival environment, but also with what this work is intending to resonate uh, 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 just generally in our lives. Our daily life is a, an immersive media installation. And so this work, you know, the, it, it, this is a point of accessibility. This work speaks to that, 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 that fact. Uh, so we, um, you know, we, we build something that is not, not really a, a white box or a black box, but uh, more of a social lounge environment uh, with, with sexy lighting and, and couches and lounges and, uh, and, and galleries that kind of um, spin off or off of the lounges. And there's also a micro cinema there that's sort of the heartbeat 
of the venue that uh, we, we present performances that engage with the moving image as well as uh, panels and forums and presentations uh, and, and where, where companies can actually present new technologies to filmmakers who want to get their hands on that. And so it's really kind of building a culture within a culture, a festival inside mm -hmm. of a festival, um, and, and, and figuring out how to integrate this exhibition into the festival at large. So I've been to enough festivals to know that there are many audiences, many different audiences, the people that just go to the, you know, the, what are going to be the award winners and the, the, the folks who go to the fringy stuff. How are, how, is, how are you seeing that audience grow? Are, are you seeing newcomers gravitate to that? Jerry mentioned earlier the issue of, you know, if, if, if our traditional filmmakers are not going <coughs> to make the move to the interactive stuff, it's just going to be the folks coming from, in a certain way, from outside uh, who are attracted to the technology and the interactivity, but maybe don't have the same storytelling chops as, as that other generation. That's, what are you finding with audiences? Is this a young, is there a profile, a demographic mm -hmm. profile? Are you seeing this? as a growing and new kind of audience that's being attractive to Sundance, how, how would you characterize that? Well, in the beginning, when we started in 2007, our very first edition of New Frontier, it was the youngest audience I think I'd seen at the festival. I mean, babies even sometimes, because we were projecting work on the, on the ground, you know, and, and, and there were children on the ground and, <laughs> you know, uh, projecting on the walls of spaces. And so it was very playful space and uh, a lot of young people um, really engaged with that on that level. We also aggressively went for a young audience as well. We developed a curriculum to be able to um, to bring high school and college students into the space because I just had we had an instinct that um, you know that audience would probably understand and and be open to what we were trying to do in the beginning stages. Um, uh, after ov over time our press department actually started to use a curriculum to talk to the press corps so mm. that to help them talk about <laughs> the work, um, to develop you know, some kind of critical uh, perspective and a way of talking about it. Because in, in the beginning, actually, they, they talked about it as art at Sundance, and they had to stop that right now. It's not art at Sundance. This is expanding cinema culture. That's what we're doing here. I think um, <clears throat> in 2009, when the independent film world kind of broke in half, uh, when you know when when the recession really hit, it hit our industry especially hard and especially early. Um, we started to see a um, an expansion of the audience for New Frontier. Mm. I think the uh, when the studios sort of lost their independent um, shingles and a lot of the companies went out of business, a lot of the executives still came to Sundance out, out of maybe love for it, out of community, out of sheer determination, you know, um, and. Uh, you know, so there was a there was a there was a love there uh, that I th and, I, and and people were looking for answers for you know what to do with um, how do we move forward when we don't have these traditional ways of funding films and exhibiting films anymore, and so so projects like Joseph Gordon Levitt's Hit Record got a lot of attention you know that year. This is a, a you know a a, a well-known American actor. Uh, has been in Hollywood movies and done a, a number of independent films. And he started a, a, a production company called Hit Record where he would crowdsource films and he would be the creative di director. That, that, um, that spoke to a new way, so a new paradigm that could be crawling up from the cracks of the broken um, stuff that, that was the detritus, let's say, of, uh, of, the, old, of the old world. So um, we're starting to get now a more diverse audience coming to it, and, um, and, and, and also a more literate audience, too. I think the first couple of years, the press corps kind of, you know, we, we set up a we brunch, um, and they talk to each other, and the artists are over here, and just scared of the artists. <laughs> and, um, but, but, and, and eventually, around 2009, 2010, we couldn't pull them off the artists. Something about maybe just their meat and potatoes, how they saw the movies. Uh, you know, I started watching movies online. Uh, most of the people that I know are streaming movies. So there's, a, there's, a, there's this notion that movies equals digital technology equals what's going on in New Frontier? What's, what's going on over there? So I think that there's, mm -hmm. there's been a maturation in the audience that, that I've seen coming through. It's been interesting. So I have a distribution question, and it and it comes from my understanding. When I think of festivals, I think of them as similar, actually, to the kind of educational thing we do at universities, mm -hmm. which is to try to translate, not to use the craziest case, but to use to sort of figure out where people are and how to how to help them 
move into where things are going and to try to help them understand it, to try to contextualize it, to try to excite them and stimulate them, but not freak them out uh, and over <coughs> overwhelm them. And um, and that sounds a bit like what you're doing with these with your choices of of, of what's going to be at uh, at New Frontier. Um, another function of festivals that's different from what we do at universities is that when something's endorsed by a festival, wins an award, is uh, nominated, but even shown, it has some credibility in terms of distribution. Distributors are, are you know, it's been vetted in a sense. And um, how is that working in this sector? I mean, we, we kind of know how it works in the, in, the, in the sector of feature films and, and linear mm -hmm. traditional documentaries. But in this sector, does that same logic hold? Are there distributors for this material? Or th is this stuff people just put up online and the only revenue model is getting money from a foundation and uh, from Tribeca and... Uh... Well, I'm, you know, make no mistake, I'm definitely trying to freak my audiences out. Um, but I'm, oh, but okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do it before they know it, they're freaked out, it's too late, and they're already freaked out, and they're like, oh wow, that's actually not so bad. It's kind of cool. <laughs> um, you know, in terms of the distribution, I mean, with the work that, that, that we tend to show at New Frontier, a lot of it is bound for the art world. A lot of it finds a home in museums, in art centers. Um, you know, some 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 work, uh, you know, operates within the in, within the space of the internet, you know, digital space. Um, but it, uh, you know, distribution, as you talk about it, sounds like you're talking about films. And, um, and you know, and, and basically that, that distribution model is widgets, you know, go, kind of going around. And just recently, has it been streamed, you know, a, a, a stream of electrons into your into your into your computer? Um, I'm not sure if if the if the marketplace is headed in that direction mm -hmm. for this work, and and I say that with some joy, <laughs> because I I think that. The marketplace, and, and, and Patricia probably will um, uh, agree with this, that the, the mark, that, that linear um, narrative actually is historically derivative. It's, it was, when, when, when cinema first came about, we actually had newsreels. It wasn't, it was, the, it was the exhibitor that was the curator of the media. And it wasn't until, you know, there was an effort to sell the work that we had established a linear narrative. So this is actually this kind of work is kind of going back to the, the origins of cinema and how and, and how it, it existed, and um, you know, it, I would like to see a new model. Um, I have no idea what it would look like. I only have ideas of how I would I I as a, an exhibition person, you know, interested in exhibition and and having the experience of being at Sundance and 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 being with Sundance, who has a history of taking one genre that didn't have a market at all, and actually had built an industry ar around it through cooperation with various players, um, and um, you know, really kind of built an industry where there was none, that there was to, might be some lessons there uh, for this new genre mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the key role that exhibition plays to create an audience for um, a kind of media that otherwise or had previously been uh, overlooked or unknown. So and, music, and music is probably another really interesting model to look at. The mm -hmm. distribution model was just d fine and dandy in the days of artifacts, mm -hmm. but now that we have, you know, online the ability to directly access things online, then the performance space actually becomes far more important as a driver of uh, a former of taste. A and, absolutely, yeah. you know. In fact, yeah. there was a, a film uh, film that I that I showed. Uh, it was a piece that I showed at New Frontier called Utopian for Movements, by uh, the, the documentarian Sam Green. Uh, and, and Dave Cerf, and he actually looked consciously to the music paradigm mm -hmm. because he knew this was he heading to his way uh, to make a, a documentary uh, that was a live performance using PowerPoint, you know, using digital technology, and uh, and it was just a and he is a beautiful piece, you know, just the resonance of like a live performance and the fallibility <coughs> talking about utopia was just really just a beautiful match. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know he he's 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 been traveling ever since 2010 with this piece, just like uh, a band would. Um, so it's 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 a new business model yeah. for a, a tried and true Oscar-nominated filmmaker. Yeah. That's terrific. Thanks. So Patty, we're going to turn to you for a few questions. And so you're 
a historian of the forum. You've worked on uh, really in the spectrum, the whole spectrum of, of documentary, as I said, home movies. Have we seen this before? Are there aspects of this development that you think are different from what's come before it? Can we expect the same patterns of containment within a couple of, you know, innovate, radical innovation and then some pretty frantic attempts to contain it? Or is there something different here? And we've already just suggested that distribution might be a, a misnomer in this sector, that there might be other ways to think of that. What's your sense? Well, I'm going to speak as a historian, a theorist, and also as a programmer. So I, I think in this moment, there's a huge tendency in certain sectors to say everything is new and every problem we saw in documentary will be resolved through interactivity, through interface, whatever. So if there's a problem of we didn't have access to tools, now we have access to tools, right? If there's a problem of only uh, people who are heavily resourced can make long form feature documentaries and conflict zones generally white and male from first world countries. Now we have user generated media. So I think there's, that's one moment we're in of just utter utopianism of uh, there's this incredible democratization of tools, ideas, et cetera. Okay, so I think that we always see that in documentary. I think you have to be hopeful to be in this field. Okay, it's a tough field to be in. Uh, you know, so I think that's a continuity. On the other hand, I think that there is, I think, if you, as you've pointed out, Bill, there's always um, issues of technology that are always challenging makers. Uh, technologies are not static, as anyone here at MIT knows. Every technology in the history of media uh, is made. Every technology has been modded and changed. Every technology has been taken apart and reversed engineered in different contexts as it goes around the world. So I think in some ways the moment we're in is a moment we've been in since 1892, right? Um, what do I think has changed? Um, what I think has changed, as, as people were talking, I thought I'd, I'd you know, make a little list. And one thing I think we're moving from is from the one to the many. Right, like the one film, right? I'll just, you know, I call them the big white whale films, right? The big feature length documentaries. There's still a place for them. I, you know, I will totally agree that there is. But now we're moving to a more variegated uh, ecosystem with a multiplication of forms. Even a feature length film may have a multiplication of forms and iterations. So, you know, back in the day, let's just say when I was in grad school in the 70s, we had fixity, right? I am going to watch this film, analyze this film, put it in a historical context. Now we have fluidity. Now we have, I'll just give you my list, and I'm sure people here can add to it. Besides long form feature films, we have search engine documentaries, right, just based on search engines. We have web archives, Hurricane Katrina archive uh, is one I particularly admire. Uh, we have user generated stories like 18 Egypt. We have live streaming, games and gamification, installation with every kind of technology imaginable, uh, performances that mix analog and digital. We have remix. We have cartographies and mapping projects. We have live music projects. We have music that uses media behind it. We have live music that uses projections. We have multimedia. We have cell phone symphonies. We have music triggered by technology, technology triggering images, guitarists triggering a remix algorithm. We have applications. We have a life. We have locative media projects investigating RFID. We have projections on every kind of surface and every kind of space imaginable. Uh, we have takeovers of screens where universities put their, you know, go to this talk, and then we have artist interface projects. We have sensor projects. We have ARGs, alternate reality gaming. We have phones. We have robotics. Uh, you know, the, I'm, I'm sure this isn't an exhaustive list. But what does this all have in common? <laughs> I just wanted to say this as we talk about, like, you know, this, uh, you know, what I would call the funeral for the long form traditional documentary, right? You know, here we are at the funeral for it. That actually, it's just part of this really um, 
kind of jungle, beautiful ecosystem of so many multiplying forms. So how do, could you put a summary on that? I, I think we're moving from fixed images in documentary to thinking about movable, endlessly mutating, always permeable, fluid interfaces. And, and that's kind of what I see. And to me, it's a really exciting moment. Uh, I think it's a moment of incredible confusion. Uh, as Ingrid said earlier, incredible anxiety, uh, incredible hope, and incredible despair. And as one of my mentors, uh, the historian Eric Barno, said, uh, in the history of media, there's never been a new technology met without equal parts of hope and despair, right? And I think it's, you know, it's extremely dialectical moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that makes it really, 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 really exciting. Um, so, so let me ask, as, a, as someone, you know, in the trade, in the academic trade. trade um, in the biz. In the biz. <laughs> literacy is a big issue. And, is and as a media scholar, yeah. part of your remit at a university is to, is to try to improve the literacy levels of our, of our students who, who consume quite a bit of media, uh, or at least it's a topic that comes up. Do you think a new set, or a new set of skills required to take on this, this plethora of new developments that you talked about, or are students coming already, are kids growing up well-armed and ready to take this on? Where do you see the place for, um, for literacies, uh, literacies in this? You know, I'm really glad you asked that question. I actually made, I, I'm a list maker, I'm a very German, so I, I sit here and make lists. Um, so, uh, literacies. Uh, here's what I think. Uh, you know, I teach courses in what I call like fixed old school film, right? Film history, show the movie, you know, here's the context, here's the history, here's the aesthetic. I also teach courses in digital theory. And what's interesting to me is I think everyone assumes the millennial generation lives in technology and knows more than we do, okay? And what I have discovered is the technology that they live in is corporatized, is individuated, is consumerist, and is a form, you'll excuse me if I make a religious uh, moment here, but it's to me a kind of digital onanism. Right, you know, you're, you're kind of there alone doing your thing. So what I have discovered, you know, in classes and also as a programmer when I go around kind of proselytizing for new forms of documentary is I think most students do not have a language to approach this new work. And probably I would say as most scholars like us don't have a language because as scholars we are trained to have, I'm going to lift this up, an image, and it's there, and you can analyze it. So what do you do when the thing starts moving around, and every time you look at it, it looks different? And maybe you're not even looking at an image, you're looking at an interface, or maybe you're looking at an algorithm or a search engine. So I think we don't have a language for it yet, because I think academia is really old-fashioned, and we want our models based on fixity. So. Uh, what I find is when I show these works in classes, or when I go around and show them, people get really excited just to have someone conjure up a space where you can argue about, about these works. Uh, I'll say one other, one other point. I want to pick up on the uh, indie band model. Um, I, I think that these business models, I get nervous when I hear the word business, but I think they're important for artists. And I think the indie band, indie music model has been really powerful for so many artists working in new media. And what I see in this paradigm is um, don't theorize, accessorize. And <laughs> what I mean by this is you'll see, you know what I'm talking about, you'll see people who have these projects, right? They're doing live remix with the music, live music, all these computers and you can buy a CD of the music, you can buy a CD of the mix, you can buy the app, you can get the t-shirt, you can get the hat, you can get the sticker. And in fact, at the forum today, uh, someone asked uh, the people from one of the projects, well, you have that t-shirt on for your project, but it's not on your website. So I think this, <laughs> this idea of, um, all, of that, that has helped some people to monetize. Um, you know, in my situation, I've had a lot of artists come to Ithaca College, <laughs> and they make a lot of money selling these mm -hmm. things, right? Um, because it's sort of a, a country of people who collect hats and T-shirts and, and all that. So I, I think it's a, 
you know, we're, we're in an odd, odd moment um, in terms of odd meaning exciting, right? Because we don't really know what we think about all of this. And to me, I think the only things we're thinking about are those that are unthinkable moments, hmm. if that makes any sense in kind of a Zen way, right? If it's confusing and unthinkable, then it's worth thinking about. And I find myself when I'm showing like those documentaries, right? The, you know, the, the flat on the wall, starts and finishes, character conflict zone, guy with a camera, cry in the audience, feel moved to participate in the bigger world outside the US movies. I find I'm kind of bored because I kind of know the paradigm. But when I see things, just to give you an example of, uh, this is uh, this artist I really like, China Tracy Kaufe from China. Okay, so the China Tracy project, she builds Chinese hyper urban cities in Second Life, but China Tracy is also a project where it's like this fake city, right, that has a website and has a mayor and they have press conferences. So it kind of moves and migrates between analog and digital, between being a performance, being Second Life. I find myself really interested in that. Why? Because it perplexes me. In the way I was trained to think as a documentary scholar, fantasy did not figure into documentary, but now, but now it does. And I made a list of a bunch of projects like that, but I won't bore you with another, another list. I'll say one, one moment I see. I think that a, his, the history of documentary, I mean, and partly this is so embedded from political movements of the 70s, has often been one of pushing out right? Um, here's an argument. Push out the argument. Convince people, right? It's a sort of can opener idea. Put the can opener on the head, crank it open, pour in whatever idea you have about whatever conflict zone is in the world, put it back on, walk out, <coughs> I am an engaged citizen of the universe. Um, so I think that kind of push out strategy we still see in some sectors. But what's interested me our works that are going in the opposite direction. And I would call them pull-in projects. Uh, projects that are about not being confrontational, not taking a can opener, usually an electric can opener, to someone's head, but that are infiltrations, invitations, inviting people into a conversation, uh, creating a convening. I mean, there's so many projects like this. And I find this to be new. Right? This is no longer about um, having so much deductive argumentation. I still think there's a role for those works. But I'm really interested in these works that kind of pull in. Um, and I think a lot of these works are not being put in theaters, but are being located in spaces where we never put films and documentaries, clubs. Um, um, people remixing on walls, uh, people doing uh, live performances um, out in space. In other words, going to where people are rather than bringing people in to where the work is. And I just think it's exciting. And, you know, I have to say, I got this idea not from projects in the U.S. I think we see projects like this in Asia, Africa, Latin America, where being in public space and creating civil society in small provisional gatherings is absolutely urgent. In countries where there have been genocide or environmental degradation or no public sphere, uh, I, I can specify this later. I, but so my summary is old school was push out, you know, go build your audience. And I think the kind of new ways that I'm seeing across all these different iterations is more of a pull in. I think it's a you know, gentler, I know a lot of old, you know, filmmakers in this other mode think this stuff is is not political. I don't even know what that means anymore. Mm -hmm. So can I make okay. one point on that? Because sure. One of the things that, I think that goes back to a point I was making earlier, though, about why I feel like we really need to be in this space, because you're, I think you're absolutely right about the pull-in versus push-out, but the people who are really good at that are brands. Um, and I think that also goes back to, you know, this experience that a lot of, I think, people have with technology. I mean, it's called inbound marketing. There's a term for it. And I think it's everywhere, and it's really pernicious. Um, 
and you know just even the way when you connect with Facebook it sort of it drifts across the internet and follows you where you go and I mean I'm not you know I'm not a conspiracy theorist about it I think there's lots of things about it that are fine actually it's kind of it is the way we're living now but I it, it does concern me in terms of like where we are in the space and I think that one of the things that I'm really interested in as well with this is actually challenging the technology a little bit. I think what Jonathan Harris is doing with Cowbird, where he actually doesn't have video, is really interesting. It's like, do we always need to have video? Why, why don't we just have a big image and slow the internet down? Or Jaron Lanier's point about you know, not dumbing ourselves down because we think technology is so amazing. And actually, sometimes we can say, well, this is what we want to do and humanize the technology. I think that's really important because the, the, the pull-in can be quite insidious as well as, as, well as very powerful. Oh, insidiously powerful, I guess. Let's open this up for questions. So if you want to make your way over to the mics. Um, where I was going to turn the conversation, or do we have someone? No. Where I was going to turn the conversation were actually challenges, and that's exactly what you guys are talking about. Um, there are a lot of challenges that face us. Um, any others that we haven't addressed? Because we've talked about quite, quite a few so far. Well, um, I guess maybe I can engage Patty on something sure. that, that you brought up that, that and, and you, uh, William, about literacy, <clears throat> I thought a lot about this in this last show in terms of how to, you know, what was important to the film, to the film community uh, to, to, to talk about, to address. And, and underlying that show is this notion, uh, and it, it has something to do with the push in, push out, is, is, is that film itself is um, changing roles. It's no longer... Uh, to be consumed, it's actually becoming part of our language. How we speak to one another, other, it's becoming a part of a, a certain kind of arch architecture, a new kind of architecture within the world we live in. So it's a, it's a very different role that it's playing. Um, if you think about you know, how we build philosophies and, 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 and conversations, it's often in exchange of tiny bits of media, bits of stories. Um, you know, how, we, how, how histories are built, you know, Lynn Hirschman Leeson's work, uh, Raw War, which is a, is a documentary, straight documentary about um, women, the women art movement in, in America and how it's been overlooked by historians. And the interactive part, uh, uh, which is called Raw War, where uh, you can, cr she basically sets up a platform to crowdsource that history. Uh, so it, thereby completely obliterating the paradigm of history making from a curatorial one to an inclusive one. You know, this, <coughs> this is, this is um, the role of the media is, is one that is, is the glue between people and society as opposed to the entertainment that, that you know, or the message. Yeah. So I think, I mean, what's really interesting there is it is, in fact, fulfilling its remit as a medium rather than simply serving from the old information model as a carrier. Yes. It's not just a, a carrier yes. of content. So we have some folks ready to give some questions. So. Um, I direct this to Patty Zimmerman. Um, doesn't this make you think a little bit back to the days of early video art and uh, in terms of breaking the medium and creating civic space uh, and also in terms of installation and what happened there? I think it really uh, is not a new paradigm, but it's actually just smaller screens, different uh, configurations of that work. Maybe speak to that a little. In fact, I have a note about this. Um, you know, I have a whole index card on that, so thanks for that question. Um, you know, I, I think when, you know, because I'm a historian like Bill, um, whenever I heard, hear the word new, uh, I go for my gun, right? Because new always carries with it uh, not just one history, but many, many histories, right? And I think as we're looking at new documentary forms or the new arts of documentary, uh, I'm really noticing a lot of both amnesia and anesthesia, right? Both. Amnesia about these histories, uh, <coughs> video art, I absolutely agree. I do not think we would have new media interactive documentary without uh, video art. And I'm from upstate New York where we had the first video art exhibitions in the United States at Syracuse University and at the Ithaca Video Festival. So I, you know, I live in the middle of that of that history, absolutely. I would even go back and say fluxus and conceptual art from the 60s, 
uh, I think is really percolating there as kind of grandfathers and grandmothers. Um, surrealist interventions, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, things like Eric Satie's Entracht. I'm thinking about uh, George Antai and the music for Ballet Mécanique. So, you know, I think these genealogies are shifting, right? That we're no longer looking at just this forward march of film, but we're now looking at new media as it has um, um, multiple uh, tributaries of, of history coming in. So I really thank you for the video art. Uh, I do think in the United States, video art was really important in this notion of the multiplication of screens and the multiplication of places and the multiplication of people, right? Like moving away from the unitary to screen. So I, I couldn't agree, agree more. Even non-linear, Ron Downey and Gary Hill were working yeah. in uh, non-linear. Yes. Uh, that was even non-linear work. I'm yeah. just putting it on the mic. Yeah. And you know, I have to give a shout out to the yes. Experimental Television uh, Center, Experimental TV Center in Owego, New York, which shuttered its doors after 40 years, which was a place that was really an epicenter for technological innovation, video art and screens. The, um, a lot of the synthesizers were invented there, and it shuttered its doors because the people who ran it are wanting to retire, but one thing that they mentioned uh, at a forum we did last year was there is no need for it anymore with uh, uh, computer technology, right? So when it, you used to have to go to the Experimental TV Center to work with synthesizers and, and do all this. So it is sort of a moment of a garden that flowered and now is transformed into many many gardens. You might think about it as a, that the forums actually have already have always been germinating all this time, but the platform has changed and thereby the access to these forums have changed and the interest but it's has changed. Uh, but it's because changed the forums as well. Right? And, and it has changed the forums. I mean if you look at the you know the work that's coming out of the NFB, you know, it, it reminds me of some of the early, you know, experimental work that I, you know, engaged saw in the eighties and programmed the early nineties. But it wasn't getting the hits, you know, and, and it and it and it wasn't as polished. You know, but it, so it's a it's a new platform as well. There's something to be said about we we, we don't know what's in our bloodstream, you know, and it, it gets executed, uh, illustrated in some way. I mean, I work for an organization that also has been producing auteur animation for 70 years. So we work, you know, side by side with people doing. A we have two animated shorts nominated for Oscars this year. That is, it's not unusual for us to incorporate animation in documentary. It's just you know given uh, when it's appropriate. So. In, in mixing media has just been part of the culture. We never saw it that way. It was only executed in that way, animation in a documentary. Now it's perhaps we're thinking about um, uh, you know, a more fluid approach with uh, interactive, and it just it comes naturally maybe without us realizing it. But I do think, I think that, that, that that's the notion of what, what it means when you think about the internet as, as artist material. You know, and, and how that changes. I mean, remembering obviously that there is this lineage, and it, it was there was actually as part of documentary fortnight at um, MoMA, um, Lauren Cornell from uh, Rhizome gave a talk about sort of documentary and and. Um, digital art sort of coming together. And someone in the audience actually did make a point about the fact that we, we sort of started quite late in terms of our presentations, and that there was actually this whole history which was very relevant to the conversation that we'd, we hadn't been able to touch on because, because of the time constraints. But I, I do think there is a bit of collective amnesia. I mean, especially in terms of the sort of new media documentary practitioners today about, and it comes back to the schmush as well. Like this is schmushing in and we don't even know what, is, what, it, you know, what that tributary is. One sort of overriding impression one has thinking about the discourse that you've engaged in today is that, uh, or at least that I have, is an old statement my mother used to make <laughs> as she became more and more impatient with certain sort of commercial developments. She said, what's wrong with the United States is there are too many flavors of ice cream. And I think, I, I have the feeling there are too many flavors of choice here. There, that is to say, you've described such a circumstance of emergent chaos that two central questions emerge that I hope everyone would, would address. The first is that this chaos causes what we might call a kind of cognitive confusion or, a, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a, some of you have used the term amnesia. Uh, one, from a, from a historical or intellectual standpoint, this new chaos creates the problem that 
um, avant-garde movements, which several of you have been just alluding to, uh, people who think of the artists who think of themselves as as subversive in some way or as 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 driving new new, new possibilities, are merging with people who are completely the opposite of avant-garde, who are ordinary uh, 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 computer well, not ordinary, but are different kinds of ordinary people in the society who use computers to make mashups or to make their own uh, own home movies, and their inclination, their impulse is quite the, it's not the same sort of ideologically uh, self-conscious move that an avant-garde artist made. What, what an irony that these two incredibly diverse populations, one almost, a, if not a mass population, a very populous group, uh, in somehow having having a convergence with with an avant-garde that incredibly complicates the situation even even just in terms of making sense of the kinds of projects that, that are emerging so uh, that's a sort of general comment about the kind of confusion I think you've described but the questions I have are twofold one we this issue has come up and it's embedded in what I've just been saying how do you deal with the broad question of what we called in our recent conference here, the instability of platforms. William mentioned this early in your discourse. What does a, uh, 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 an aspiring young documentarian of all, uh, even a diverse one who has some competence across different media platforms do in w facing not only the enormous number of choices that are available to her, but also beyond that, the deep, deep question of whether or not the platforms chosen will be around in five years. What do what do we do with uh, uh, leaving leaving aside what that means for archivists and librarians and, and and people who want to sort of keep a history of the thing? What do we do about the fact that we seem to be in a moment in which platforms are so totally unstable? It, uh, you're putting out a, a, a question. <coughs> um, that describes a lot of confusion, but actually the answer is very simple. And it's been this, the same answer from the beginning. You start with your story. And what's the, the only difference is it, it's, it, it gets confusing if you start, if you try to fit the, the, the round peg in a square hole. If you're thinking about these kinds of new forms uh, and, 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 and engaging with them in old ways, in, in ways that are passive, uh, and, and they're all these, they're, they're so different, and. They have to be um, categorized in a certain way. But if you have a story and you want to tell the story, if you, if you flip the script on the, on the filmmaker or the, the storyteller, these are options to tell the story simultaneously, all at once. And it's the same story. It's, it's, it's the story world that they're building. So I would say you know, the, you know, for, for filmmakers who are growing up and, and, and wanting to, to tell stories, you don't have to choose one or the other. Start with your story. What is it that you want to tell? And then think about how you could communicate it given these different platforms. Uh, and remember that there, these platforms are not necessarily going to be monetized in the ways that they used to, but you might actually expand your reach uh, for the, the conversation you want to have, uh, the message you want to give, the world that you want to paint. Um, it, it might expand. And that that's sort of the payout. That's the um, that that's that's what you get out of out of these new forms that are not yet monetized, and who knows if they might not be down the line. Well, one one response to that, I, I, one way to respond to what you've said is to say that's a very conservative response. I mean, I like it very much because what it says is forget about this cornucopia of choices you have. Make rational, much much more concise and narrow selections depending on what you want to say, and, uh, it, it, depending on your vision of experience. That you that that all that all the options need not be or are, are are inappropriate for particular kinds of stories. But it seems to me that there are much uh, bigger issues involved, having to do with. The, I'm not even talking about monetizing things, but you want your material to last, uh, and you put it on one system and it's gone. I mean, I, I'm wondering about that, and even about people who want to fund projects that go on platforms that have not established a life uh, a lifestyle a life uh, 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 trajectory. So, uh, <laughs> get ready. Um, okay, I, I think this, it's interesting to me, like when you use the words chaos and instability, because as somebody who's a, a, been, spent a long time working in critical historiography, post-colonial and post-structuralist theorists, 
um, are constantly asking for instability and for looking at chaos. I mean, if we look at Ranaji Guha, for example, Indian historiographer, he <coughs> argues, uh, why is it we cannot discuss the ghosts that don't exist, the specters who are in history, right? So uh, chaos and instability, I think, are really uh, important uh, because I think that the work that we're looking at now across all these different forms Actually, we're in the realm that art historians call the post-object. So I don't think we're really looking anymore in the same way or thinking the same way about we are going to preserve this, you know, this film or this particular interface or this algorithm or this. I think that in the realm of the post-object where the performative and the iterative and precisely the instability and the chaos are part of the build of the work, right? It's almost like the, the code or the algorithm of the work that we're shifting into a different set of concerns, right? Maybe all that matters is that we can describe what Sam Green did, right? But we may never have a documentation of what that's like because each project, I mean, many of the projects that I'm interested in change wherever they're shown, change in particular locations, and it's exactly this chaos and instability that is the break with, with the past. Um, and then I'm going to just provide something very zen. Um, I think sometimes in Western cultures, we want everything to be saved, but Everything is always deteriorating, and as historians, we know this. I mean, I've spent my whole career looking at work that's not saved in archives, right? And it's just never there, so you're endlessly dealing with absence. So instead of, for lack of a better word, being hysterical about absence, we have to embrace the absence and embrace the deterioration because we don't really want anything to stay the same if we adopt a post-colonial historiography, right? And this means realizing everything will become a ghostly specter. And I know that sounds really theoretical, but I really believe it. Um, and I, I want to just give a larger, more concrete example, which is engaged media in Indonesia, which is a kind of um, incredible project for the Asia Pacific for environmental and human rights. Um, technologists, artists, NGOs gathering together, user uploaded, but it's citizen journalism and it's NGOs and it's activists and human rights groups. Uh, now, this emerged out of uh, reformasi movements in the late 90s to create a civil society in Indonesia. Now, for them, uh, it exists online, but many communities they work in, in Indonesia or in the Asia Pacific, uh, don't have electricity. So the only way to show this work where there's no bandwidth and there's no internet connection is to put it on a USB stick and bring a generator into Papua where there's, it's a big conflict zone now. But I would wager if you talk to people who are working with engaged media, the issue is not to save those images, but actually to create civil society for debate, for engagement, for public gatherings in Indonesia and rebuild that country and that national identity after uh, um, Suharto. So I think sometimes we have to really remember that documentary is about being urgent. It's about communicating with others about that which matters which are really life or death issues. And they're different around the world, but I, I would just say, does it matter for engaged media to have this all saved? Or is there maybe a goal of, of really working to, for, for other, other issues? So, you know, I'm kind of polemical and I apologize. I hope you'll be gracious to me, but you raised a that, great that, question. That was, an, that was an exciting answer, and I certainly agree with a lot of what you've said. But document, I feel like, I mean, documentaries to me, you know, I've always been really nervous of, um, I mean, because I, I used to work in, uh, in uh, Channel 4 in the UK and commissioning, and um, I was always really nervous uh, about people talking about sort of documentary, you know, with a sort of a wide brush, because 
I, the kind of films I was looking at, the, then it was film, you know, films, they were of a certain length, but they were so different and they were doing such different things. And I think in this space now, I mean, I, I agree, I, you know, I definitely embrace the instability. I, 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 that's the thing about it right now that I think is so exciting. Um, but I, I'm really nervous about, I, like every project is really different and every project has different goals. And you know, not all documentaries need to change the world. I, I think that projects do different things for different people, and sometimes they need to reach lots and lots of people, and sometimes they need to reach just a very small handful of people, but do something in a very particular way. And I, so for me now, what I think is you know really interesting about this space is, is um, you know, how, just knowing what your digital palette is. That's how I always think about it. Like if you don't know what your options are, like so for example, one of the things that really concerns me is a lot of filmmakers or makers or creators in the space are incredibly disconnected from the politics of the internet um, and they don't really think about open source code or net neutrality or any of these issues which are really going to affect all these conversations we're having in this room right now. I mean if they change the way the internet works then all these conversations we're having are going to change and post object or pre object or I mean we're not going to be able to do the same kinds of work so you know I think that kind of the politics of the code and the politics of the technology is also really really important knowing what our digital palette is and protecting the bits of that palette that we you know that for, which for me is a free and open internet is really really key I, I think I'm just going to echo some of what's been said I, I think you know while Film and video are an incredibly stable platform, or we think of them as an incredibly stable platform. You know, there are tens of thousands of independent documentaries that have vanished, and nobody seems to care. Uh, you know, they, they could be physically preserved, but they aren't. And uh, so they're completely inaccessible or gone, uh, despite the fact they're, you know, they're fixed in a medium that we kind of understand. So in some ways, interactive documentaries are going to share the same fate that, that those documentaries already have. Um, th there's no question that there's been very, very little discussion about the lifespan of, of interactive documentaries. I think in some ways it's even a, an assumption that they'll just date so quickly. Uh, you know, projects we did uh, five years ago look dated to us in a way that, you know, a classic documentary film doesn't. And so there's almost this, you know, I'd be happy if nobody's looking at it six years from now. Um, but I, I think it's partly because of who's been involved. And it, it, again, it speaks to that. I'm, I'm not um, suggesting that only documentary filmmakers should occupy this space, not at all. But I think it's often been people who've been doing the hard labor of building interactive sites have usually been doing they pay the rent by doing corporate work that isn't meant to last. So they don't have an archival mentality that there's some user that needs to see this corporate video, corporate interactive project seven years from now. It's, it's nobody cares, really. Um, but I do feel that interactive is, is already, a, an interactive documentary sensibility is already having, um, a, I think, a good influence on the creativity of linear documentaries because there's simply so many stories that were never told in the linear form. Um, you know, what a new form maybe does is allow us to look at the old form. That's a pretty obvious thing to say, look at the old form um, in a way we haven't before. And so, you know, in a country like Canada and most countries in the world, a, a, an hour-long documentary that's on television is actually 43 minutes, you know, a TV hour. And so, magically, most of the proposals we received in the last 20 years were 43-minute ideas. Um, you know, it's like every novel had to be 253 pages. Um, so now, they, you know, ideas were turned down. Your story is too thin. It won't fill 43 minutes or feature length. It's not, it's not strong enough to sustain that. Well, now it doesn't matter. If it's four minutes, it can work, uh, either as a short film online for a big audience or as an interactive piece. So I think that's... Liberating, but I think there. I really believe there is a sensibility in interactive documentary, which is somewhat different and maybe less journalistic uh, to some extent. I think it's drawing in a more artistic approach. Or something. There's something about the peripheral vision, the marginal vision that is that uh, you know. If we if we said we were going to make a, a film about it, it would seem trivial. But when it's done as part of an art installation, there's something human and personal about it, and people people don't turn up their noses. I guess it's a the challenge to filmmakers, documentary filmmakers, is to have a kind of preconceptual moment. And rather than say, I have an idea to make a film, it's just, I have an idea. And let's see what the right form is for that. You know, an, ex an excellent example is uh, this piece called Question Bridge. Uh, that was a subject of conversation earlier today. 
And I, and I think about this, this piece in relation to another film that we showed at Sundance called Love, uh, which is, was an autobiographical um, a story about, and these, 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 two, these two pieces are stories about black men. Uh, Love is a, is a specific story, a beautifully told story, this narrative film about a young boy coming of age, uh, falling around his um, his uncle who just got out of the um, out of prison, but wanting you know to, to establish a, a legit business, uh, it is a fantastic film, and the, and the story that that filmmaker wanted to tell was that specific story. In the in the in the in the in the case of Question Bridge, uh, the the filmmakers, the artists, their story wanted they what they wanted to do was to have black men tell their own story, uh, established through conversation, not so much conversation, but just to tell their own story. So they had this digital, digital, uh, you know, a digital platform available to them so that what was really important, and it's always important to have you know, a record, but I think what's, what was the most important for, for those makers was to, ha to create a conversation amongst black men using new digital technology in a way that has never been possible before because the digital technology enabled these men to speak from a safe space and uh, in a very focused way. And, and, and the payoff was so enormous, I can't tell you uh, how this thing played at Sundance. It, it played to all kinds of races and all kinds of creeds and colors. And, and having access to a conversation between black men that just that really just wouldn't be possible outside of the safe, safe space that this digital technology Provided, so you can call that um, you know you can call that you can ha and you can have anxieties about you know preserving this work and certainly I respect that you know from the academy, but boy did it ever uh, achieve the goal of the makers and boy did it ever contribute to American society by opening up a conversation that was just never possible before. It's actually a perfect segue to my question. You touched upon it, actually, but I'll ask it anyway. So throughout this talk of, um, <clears throat> you know, just it, it seems as though we might all agree that the form of the documentary, if anything, it has transitioned to uh, open up some opportunities instead of just telling a story and, you know, having that story exist in, in its form and perhaps a dialogue would exist after that, but that would be it. Instead of that, um, we have an opportunity here with, with these new forms of technology to, to sort of initiate a continuum, uh, to start with an idea perhaps, and start with a call to action perhaps, but importantly, uh, keep people engaged in this story, um, or at least I see that opportunity, so that the, you know, the, the story can just evolve and, and grow organically. Um, so if, if you agree with that notion, would you also agree that um, the role of the creator has, has also evolved to encompass not just coming up with an idea or even um, presenting a call to action um, for the general public to respond to, but also to, to equip uh, the general public or at least their target audience uh, with with the tools to empower them to respond back and to actually engage, to empower them to engage in the story, mm -hmm. to create part of the media. Um, so for example, similar to what you just described, um, you know, I see the artist as, as coming up with a framework to say, all right, I want these, these stories to bubble up on their own. And, and to me, that's, that's a, an important shift. Um, I guess I'm not directing it to anyone in particular, but if anyone would like to respond on, to that. I actually was, was thinking, um, you know, what is a significant shift we're seeing across all these forms? And it is from the idea of an individual director with a kind of logocentric point of view or maybe a, you know, political point of view or a whatever, give voice to the voiceless, make an image of the image, imageless, right? To like, I, I call it the, uh, you know, the documentary of reparation, right? Repair something. And I think what we're moving towards, at least in the projects I'm interested in, and, and again, you know, uh, I'm seeing this all over the world, and I want us to be really careful that we just don't center everything in countries of the global north. I think we're shifting from this idea of the director of the reparation to the convener and designer of the experience that creates 
conversations and convenings, I think Question Bridge, High Rise, I mean, so many of these projects have this, share this. Um, uh, and this idea it becomes aleatory, right? It becomes unpredictable. And the unpredictability of this becomes that which motors uh, the project. I think we're shifting from the idea of a story to the idea of stories. You know, Salman Rushdie calls it the sea of stories, not the drip of a story, but the sea of stories. And he says in Harun and the Sea of Stories, we're in the boat, we take our cup, and we dip it into the sea of stories. And I think that that's a great theoretical model for thinking of these user-generated mm -hmm. projects. Uh, I said earlier in the day, I think we're moving from Shakespearean generic models to what I would call, again, my old 70s feminist erupts, so pardon me, to what I would call the Scheherazade model, right, of multiple stories. I think we're moving from one kind of sense of temporality to multiple temporalities. We're maybe moving a little bit from time to different spatializations. I think high rise to me emblematize that, right? It's, it's a space. So, I mean, where are we is we're rethinking structures and we're thinking of structures in ways that are about thinking of ways of creating conviviality. I, I think these hard-hitting, in-your-face projects are still a, a space for them. And, but I, I think in some parts of the world, to make a hard, in-your-face work is going to put you in jail or you'll lose your life. Uh, and that sometimes creating spaces for conviviality, uh, I'll give you the example, in Indonesia or Malaysia or parts of India, um, Nigeria, have become really important. Um, they are a mode of survival. Um, I think we're seeing these projects migrate. I, I don't like this term transmedia because transnational corporations use it. So I try to use the term migratory because it's kind of environmental, right? You know? So, you know, do you know what I mean? It's like we're migrating. And so uh, I really thank you for that, that, that question because I think it gets to um, the ethical heart of uh, what so many of these projects people have described. Um, uh, you know, I think we're not looking at big movements as much anymore as we're looking at safe spaces, small spaces, hijacked spaces, occupied spaces, but they're smaller spaces. Uh, there are microtopias, if, if you will, so thanks. But, but there is, uh, there, just to be the, bring it back to prosaic funding and, and sustainability for whoever the creators are, um, there are real issues around that because, you know, the one thing we do know, it's very hard to get any kind of documentary made, um, we all know that, but with a, with a linear documentary, you pretty much know how much it's going to cost and you, you, you can pretty much time it out. I mean, there's all sorts of things that might come up as you make your film, but you know what the development period looks like, you know what the production period looks like, you pretty much know how long you're going to be in the edit and you know what the distribution looks like after that. With these projects, that's not the case at all. And so with 18 Days in Egypt, which is exactly what you just described, um, you know, it's incredibly exciting for Jigger and Yasmin, but they're also like, oh my God, like what are we, in, you know, what do we get ourselves into? Because and when does it end? Because there is no end. It was called 18 Days in Egypt, but they realized, that, you know, right. that the story of Egypt didn't end on the last day of the revolution. Um, and so, you know, this, this project is continuing. And also they realized there was a huge digital access issue. They, that a lot of the things they expected to happen didn't happen because, you know, one of the things I always say when people say, oh, there'll be user-generated content, I'm like, if you're lucky. Um, the lot, you know, the, the, the best problem to have is how to moderate that content. Um, generally, you don't even get any content. So, uh, so one of the issues they had is um, having to actually have fellows on the ground in Egypt you know, taking sort of tablets and phones around to actually collect these stories. Um, and I mean, this, this is all incredibly exciting. If you talk to either one of them, they will, you know, tell you lots of stories about how they've really changed about, they've changed the way they think about them, their roles as, as storytellers. Uh, Jigger calls himself a, I don't know what he calls himself now, but he has a very, and he comes from an interesting space as well because he used to work in multimedia journalism. So he's always felt quite comfortable, I think, sort of dancing between worlds. Um, but I think it has been quite, challenging for them. And I think, you know, looking ahead, um, there, there's going to be a lot of really difficult decisions to make. Um, and I think a lot of this also comes back to, you know, do, um, having good partnerships on board so that you do actually have a long-term 
plan and maybe there's an exit strategy for you as the creator if necessary um, because I you know I still I, I always talk about this but I do always think about um, people you know paying their rent and maybe being able to retire one day I think it's really important yeah um, thank you both for uh, tremendous responses um, and if I could just follow up quickly um, I, you touched upon a key point which inspired the question. I mean, I, I see that there are different places in the world and they have different capabilities. It's one thing to look at, you know, the latest iPad that's coming out and think of all the exciting ways that we can use it. That's important. That's great. Someone's got to do that. But someone also has to bring these tools to people who, you know, have a hard time finding water or whatever. Their story still needs to be told and they need to engage, even if it's within their local community. <clears throat> um, and so, I guess just to reiterate, I would. I would see the role of this creator as sort of this amalgamation of, of um, the technologist whose responsibility is to, you know, if they're applying for a grant or something, they they m might scope out the work and say, I'm, I'm building this tool and this is these are the features that it's going to have. Perhaps the documentary maker uh, has to start doing, or maybe not has to, but has an opportunity to, to do something like that, to say, you know, I, I actually just want to empower these people in a unique way, and um, and this is the scope of the project that I that I intend to deliver. Would you ever see something like that floating? Or, well, I, I mean, what you know, one of the things that makes me incredibly nervous in uh, in applications is <laughs> is when people talk about giving voice to the voiceless, because I think that's the most patronizing. Uh, you know, I mean, it's 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 a it's a reflex phrase that people use, but you know, I think looking at technologies now and going back to that idea of the digital palette, you know, there there people have technologies everyone has some kind of technology um, yeah true and, and there are ways of way. accessing them so I mean I you know I absolutely agree and I do always think about appropriate technologies and and the way that we're creating these stories but but I, I think that one actually what 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 has been amazing about this new way of creating stories and, and creating stories with people is actually really challenging that idea of like the the savior filmmaker giving voice to yeah. the voiceless um, I think that's really really important I totally agree and I just want to raise like another Point, and this is sort of a Cassandra point, uh, which is, um, you know, I've been in a lot of forums in the last couple of years where people are so excited about user-generated upload content. Um, and I speak as someone who's lived a lot in Southeast Asia, okay? So you hear this, you know, and what I've heard in Southeast Asia and in India is uh, user-generated content, Ameri they call it American-generated content. <laughs> Right, and I've heard that everywhere I've been in the global south. So, and you know, I think we have to realize that technologies, networks, and nodes are not the same around the globe. And I don't want to fall back into <coughs> old 90s talk about digital divides because, I mean, we have places that are leapfrogged, right? Singapore is more technologically sophisticated than the United States. But we have, you know, governments that can shut down different nodes at will. Uh, we don't have YouTube in China, but we have a vital underground documentary movement in the D cinema. And I, I want to just raise this issue, and it's an ethical issue, which is right now, an image made is an image that will circulate across many networks, across many nodes, across many countries. And it is an image that will be remixed beyond recognition. And I think you brought that up th this morning. It will be remixed beyond recognition. So there becomes a question of what are the ethics of UGC when we're thinking that um, works are being maybe made on cell phones in places where if your image is on the internet, the security forces are going to crowdsource you and put you in jail. We saw this in Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen it in Burma. We've seen it in India, uh, we've seen it in Indonesia, and we've seen it in parts of West, West Africa, right? So what do we do with this? And I think there's a lot of work being done by Engage Media, by Tactical Technology Collective, Witness. by Witness, mm -hmm. to, and I've been working on a project with Sam Gregory from Witness on circulatory media and ethics. So if we say an image made and an image uploaded is going to be recirculated, I think we have to go back to human rights discourse that emphasizes the dignity of the subject. And now subjects and uploaders need to realize that the glories of uh, you know, having all these cameras 
can also be um, the difficulties of security forces uh, of getting you and putting you in jail, or it could be the, the difficulties of maybe you're not going to get that scholarship to the university because you were in protest movement or you said something. So, you know, I, I just find I have to think a lot to refocus on the dignity of the subjects in a circulatory universe. Is it always important to have an image of everything? Is it always important to have a face? So, for example, witness and engage media are working, I think they're going to roll this out soon, with a cell phone app that if you're in a conflict area, it'll blur faces, right? So it'll document abuse, but it will blur faces. This has been really very, very important, um, you know, in Indonesia and in the Middle East and in North, North Africa, because we've seen what security forces uh, uh, do here. So I, I don't mean to be the person who throws the water on the party, but um, I think sometimes we have to still think about those old ideas from documentary, which is about we in the documentary world are telling stories about other people. And I always think we have to always center ourselves by not being centered on ourselves. We have to think about the subjects. Some people are in conflict zones, some are in places where they don't have good water. So we have two more questions and in about eight more minutes. So if I could ask both of you to give your questions and then we can take them on as a pool. Sorry, I'll say this quickly since we're running out of time. Um, Sam Gregory teaches a class at the Kennedy School in January. It's an open enrollment class for cross-registration for anyone who's here who's interested. And he's um, from the Witness Program. So, And I took his class this January as part of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy, and it was great. So I recommend it. Um, but my question is switching back to the question of money. Um, and you brought up a very important point about um, new revenue streams or, or being creative with our revenue streams. And I wanted to point out that um, social enterprise and social entrepreneurship are the big buzzwords these days around here. Um, and then we also have social change media, and it seems that never the two shall meet, uh, at least not around here. Um, um, I'm taking a class in a Harvard Business School, Harvard Kennedy School class on social entrepreneur entrepreneurship right now, and all the case studies are on things like healthcare, Zipcar, uh, microcredit finance, uh, and there's nothing in there about media. and. So it really got me thinking, like, um, are there any cases out there where we can show um, tried and, and tried, tried well and failed, or tried well and succeeded, uh, where we can look to um, these new tools of doing good by doing well by doing good? Now, we know that in, in this type of work, we do a lot of good, but we don't always do well. <laughs> We're not always making enough money to pay the bills. So. Um, I really wanted to go back to that question, if you don't mind, and see if any of you are willing to talk about this sort of um, meeting of these two spheres and seeing um, if you know of anything where this engagement is happening or if this is a place where we need to do more work, and if so, what do you think? I, I, well, I mean, sorry, just to leap in, I think there's lots and lots of amazing examples of exactly that. I mean, I don't know if necessarily the media makers would consider themselves social entrepreneurs. Some of them might. Jigger certainly would. He's got a really interesting, I think he's like a social media entrepreneur or a media entrepreneur, but, um, but there's, I think there's lots and lots of examples of that kind of work being done through media in really powerful ways. I mean, Paco and Pamela with, um, with, the, rec with the Reckoning and, and, and more recently with Granito have done some incredible work. And I mean, Granito really has affected real, you know, real world change um, in Guatemala. And they're creating an, uh, a sort of a memory, what's it called, the memory? Every memory matters. Every memory matters. Uh, you know, to collect stories uh, with the forensic teams in Guatemala. Um, I mean, there's, I, you know, I think that that's actually one of the, the, the really interesting and really urgent things that is happening in media. I think, I think maybe we are a little bit nervous about calling ourselves anything with the word entrepreneur in it. 
Um, I don't know why that is, but I think maybe I think I think that work's happening. We just don't call it that, and maybe we don't get recognised for that as a result. Anybody? Else? Well, is it is it compiled somewhere? I mean, this, it's important that someone who like myself is trying to go out there and make the media happen, and and you know, on bare bones in the beginning, and then tr you know, trying to raise the money and pull it together, and and it's really good to have these these uh, examples to pull from. And I'm wondering if that seems like a good project if it hasn't already been done to pull them together as a body of work. Has anybody got anything else um, to say? I have an example, and it's from Malaysia. Um, and uh, you know, I think sometimes we focus so much on media that we forget that larger social, political, historical um, configurations often have lacks that media can meet. So I'll give you this concrete example, which is the website Malaysia Kinney. It's the oppositional uh, citizen journalism news website in Malaysia. It's um, started because, as you probably know, Malaysia has a multimedia corridor where it is doing quick leapfrogging development with new technologies. But Malaysia has a lot of film censorship and television censorship for a variety of reasons. I mean, they would call it regulation. Here in America, we'd call it censorship. But there's an opposition movement in Malaysia. And so what did they do? The Malaysians never regulated the internet because that would stop transnational companies like Microsoft and digital developers from coming into the multimedia corridor. So the internet had an opening. So Malaysia Kinney became uh, this site of citizen journalists telling stories of the opposition movement in Malaysia. Not regulated, not censored, because to do that would be bad for business. Films, you know, narrative films, documentaries, censored. So Malaysia Kinney is now one of the most economically successful internet projects in all of Southeast Asia. Right? Who would have thought it? So, but again, is it because it's an online citizen journalist project? No. It's because it worked the cracks, right, and fulfilled a need, right? A need for a kind of civil society public discourse, um, you know, around these economic development issues and, and political issues. And I think it's a really exciting example. In fact, I was at a, a journalist conference in Singapore where every major daily newspaper all over Asia was asking Malaysia Kinney how they could have citizen journalism for their big commercial enterprises. So, uh, you know, just one example, but the example I think requires not thinking about media that can be monetized, but thinking about uh, thinking about where in social, political, historical configurations is there a crack, is there a need, is there an urgency? Great, I think we have to wind it down here on this very optimistic note. And let me just give a plug to the civic media folks here, uh, because that's a place where a lot of these conversations also occur about alternate forms of both gathering information, giving it form, getting it out to publics. Uh, that work terrifically in all sorts of cultural spaces. Uh, and they have very regular events, so just keep an eye on the website for the Center for Civic Media, because that's, that's their core work. I want to thank our panel. Um, it was a terrific conversation. Thanks very much. Thank <laughs> and I'd like to invite everyone. We're having a reception over in the Stata Center, the fourth floor, the R&D pub. So uh, if you're up for some food and drink, Follow us over there. It'll be fun. Thanks.